So I just want to welcome everyone to the Mishmatic Traveling Workshop that we had um, funded by AMATIC Traveling Workshops, uh, a grant. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the workshop that we're going to have on diversity, equity, and inclusion by Ann Sidmer and Claire Burke, both um, from the West Coast. I had to wake up very early for this. Um, <laughs> our presentation is on changing the game in two-year college mathematics classrooms. So I'm going to turn it over to Ann and Claire. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, welcome to Changing the Game in Two-Year College Mathematics Classrooms. Um, so I'm excited. We're, we're excited to be here and to um, always learning and uh, you know, learn with you, our colleagues. So, so looking forward to a fun couple of hours. Um, so go, we, I think we can go next slide. Yeah. So today, um, things we're gonna work on, we're gonna uh, first come to know each other as educators committed to social justice, and we're gonna review some concepts from the equity and practice reading that you all hopefully got um, by using these concepts to make sense of our work. Um, and then we're gonna talk about signature pedagogies uh, to kind of challenge some, some, some of our beliefs and assumptions that uh, continue to uh, make, you know, create inequities in our classrooms and um, and then we're going to demonstrate our understanding of the three components of inclusive pedagogy. Um, we're going to talk about access, belonging, and success and we're going to develop some strategies we can use in our quote classrooms. <laughs> so a little... Uh, Where's the introduction? I must have missed yeah. it. I think you just were too go. excited about the <laughs> Can people see this? See this now? Okay. So as Mike said, my name is Claire Burke. Um, I work at Lynn Benton Community College. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, just want to acknowledge that um, I am a white lady and <laughs> we, you know, um, been sort of brought to this work with my my own experiences being a woman in math and then also I have a transgender son and so watching him sort of go through um, being in classrooms and the sorts of issues that come up and the inequities that occur because of his his own identity um, so that's kind of brought me into the into this work um, so well, I'm Ann Sinever. Um, I'm at Oregon State University. Um, Lynn Benton Community College is our, our local community college here. Um, I was at Portland Community College for many years, so I taught, I, I, I come to this fairly, this, this room. Um, and I work at Oregon State, I work on a project, it's a faculty development project called Inclusive Excellence at OSU. And we're working with STEM faculty around these issues. And that's how I met Claire. She was one of our fellows last year. Um, because we're also working not just with OSU faculty, but faculty at two community colleges. Also, another white woman, um, really committed to this work though. I think for me, I'm just really passionate about changing the game so that we have, you know, more students of color who are able to get to the college level math courses. Uh, Portland Community College, we have a really bad, it just, students of color just weren't getting to college level mathematics. And uh, so I'm just really committed to this, to this work. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of go around and ask people to introduce themselves, say something, you know, share identities, um, and also kind of what brings you to this work. And I'm just gonna go around for what I see on my screen. So I'll start with Julie. I'm your fearless host for today. <laughs> so, so of course I would be here. Um, obviously very interested in what you guys have to, um, to share with us today. Thank you. Mike? I'm at Lansing Community College. Um, I'm not actually from Michigan. I'm from the Appalachian area of southern, out southeast Ohio, but white male. But I'm very interested in this work and that Lansing Community College actually did a study a couple years ago on um, African-American males reaching college level math. And we were, we we're of course, struggling. So we're really interested in, in increasing our success in that area. Yep, thank you. Jeff? My name is Jeff Brown. I teach at Oakland Community College. And I guess what piqued my interest was uh, a podcast I heard a couple weeks ago in which they described, you know, um, kind of uh, equity in education and 
uh, kind of a, a little bit of truth in education. And they talked about in STEM courses, how there's not much representation for minorities, uh, et cetera. And one thing that shocked me was they interviewed somebody in my field, statistics. <laughs> and I didn't really realize, but a lot of the big names like uh, Sir Francis Galton and uh, who was it? Not, not Student T, but uh, R.A. Fisher uh, used, used their statistics to help further a policy of eugenics. And I was like, what? I mean, it's just part of statistics I never realized. So it's, uh, it's made me a little bit more sensitive to the issues that might surround my classroom and I wanted to find out more. Thank you, Jeff. Barbie? Hi, I'm Barbie. Oh. Hang on. Hang on. Hi, I'm Barbie Hogue. I teach at Oakland Community College also. A white woman, I'm interested in it from um, the equity uh, aspect. I'm seeing many of the black students in my class just not performing as well, mostly because of their outside situations. Thank you. Emily? Uh, like Julie, Jeff, and Barbie, um, I'm from Oakland Community College. <laughs> you have a lot of us here. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I, I'm probably here for similar reasons that Barbie's here for. It's noticing the differences sometimes in our students and their backgrounds. Thank you, Emily. Lisa? Hi, my name is Lisa Mitchell. I teach at Eastern Michigan University. I teach mainly uh, developmental math classes. Um, so I'm here to broaden my knowledge and possibly in, implement some different aspects into my teaching. So thank you, Lisa. Jeffrey? Hi, I'm Jeff Morford from Henry Ford College. I use he and him pronouns and 23 and me says mostly North, Northwest European ancestry. Um, uh, actually, we just got some uh, disaggregated data back today on our co-requisites, which anecdotally we thought we were really closing the gap uh, based on racial ethnic um, background and I think we have but we're still seeing a 10 to 15 percent gap and we need to do better and we're going to try to do better. Thank you Jeffrey. The next three people I see on my screen I don't see your name so I see a woman wearing glasses and a blue sweater with dark straight hair. <laughs> Deborah. <laughs> Hi. Yes um yeah, thank you. My name is Deborah Ingram. Uh, thanks for putting this together. I'm a likely son from Eastern Michigan University as well. I'm the department head for the math and stats department. Um, like many of you have said, um, interested in uh, equitable teaching and kind of um, momentum that we have gathered from our Gateways to Completion project, which I think several of you have participated in. Um, lots of Michigan schools have worked on that. And um, similar to what Jeff just said, our, um, our Gateways to Completion project was a, a big success, but actually um, the data did not close the gap nearly as much as, as we you know, had hoped. And so, although I say it was a success, there was a lot of disappointment. So um, anyway, just want to keep on going and learn from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next person with no name on my screen, you're wearing a turtleneck kind of rose color sweater, short hair. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Hi Sandy. I'm Sandy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sandy Johnson, and I am also from Eastern Michigan University. I teach developmental and introductory level math classes, and um, probably usually at least two thirds of my classes are either African American or Latino, and I see how they struggle. Um, really, just. They come very ill-prepared, many students, and 
you know, especially in the developmental math, but in general at all of our classes, we try really hard to um, help people who are struggling. Um, you know, we want to get them to the point where they can be successful and they can continue in college and actually graduate and not drop out as so many do. So I, I feel really strongly about that inequity and am wanting to do whatever I can to try and, you know, improve that. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, next person with no name on my screen is a, appears to be a man with short hair, bangs, glasses, a dark shirt on. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm, and I'm Andrew Ross. Uh, I teach um, mostly calculus and up at Eastern Michigan University. Um, so unlike uh, Sandy's classes, I have very few African-American students in my Calc 1 class and up. Uh, so I'm looking to improve my Calc 1 class, do more equitable teaching, um, and uh, I check pretty much all the privilege boxes, white, cis, straight, male in math. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. Tanya. Hi, my name is Tanya Reynolds. I, like Jeff, Emily, Barbie, and Julie, I teach at Auckland Community College. I teach all the classes from pre-algebra all the way to calculus three and differential equations. And over the years, I have noticed that the racial profile of the class changes as you're moving up in levels in math. And I was curious what we could do to actually change it a little bit to be a little more equitable in the upper end classes. Thank you. Okay, next person that I can't see a name on. You have your fist on your chin. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Casey. I am also from Eastern Michigan. We have a good contingent here, so that's awesome. Um, I come from the mathematics teacher educator position. I was a high school math teacher for 14 years and now I'm a math teacher educator at Eastern Michigan. So I see my interest in two things. One is the um, diversity of secondary math teachers um, is pretty lacking. So trying to increase diversity there and also helping our teachers that we are preparing to be prepared to teach with the diverse student body they are going to be working with in the secondary schools, that hopefully they will be better prepared when they do come to um, two-year and four-year colleges, like you guys are remarking. So um, being able to meet all learners and support um, students with uh, whatever they may need to be successful. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. One more, no name. Um, it was woman, hair to be a woman, blonde hair, shoulder length, wearing, looks like a sweatshirt with a hood. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, Cr Christy, you're muted still. Correct. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, I'm Christy Laird, and I'm from Jackson College. And like uh, many of you, we've been involved with the work of trying to increase our success for a number of years through various things, um, achieving the dream and pathways and things like that. And while we've been very pleased with um, what we've been able to do to increase success rates overall, we haven't had as much success uh, closing the gap as we would like. And so again, uh, I'm really interested to learn today more of the uh, things that we might be able to do to improve that gap situation. Great, great. Um, Tanya? I already talked. Okay, thank you. Um, that's right, I remember now. Andrew? Uh, maybe there's another Andrew, but I already had my turn. Okay, thank you. No, uh, yeah, people are moving around the screen. Um, Amy? Hi everyone, um, I'm Amy Bonham and I'm in a little different boat than most of you. I'm actually a school improvement coach at a high school in Monroe um, and uh, I was a math teacher prior to becoming the school improvement coach and even at the high school level we see students coming to us starting in freshman math which is probably some of that developmental math or even that eighth grade math um, really struggling with mathematics and I got shared this opportunity in email and I thought it'd be really interesting to see how I could even in start using this to share with my teachers through some professional development opportunities and helping them grow mathematically to reach our students at an even an earlier age with um, um, the equity in mathematics. Great, thank you. John. 
Uh, let me see. Uh, you might be able to see me at, at some point, but I, I'm not actually sure. But uh, uh, I think that I, uh, yeah, I, I'm John Oaks, and I teach at uh, Macomb Community College. And uh, let's see, I, I think that like I saw Barbie's comment about the audio being terrible, and that's why I had my camera and everything off, but. Uh, so I didn't really catch everything I was supposed to, to say because of the audio issue here. But uh, I, I know that I have been like interested in uh, like uh, not only like being uh, better for, for my own students, but uh, how uh, uh, like uh, I might be able to contribute to the broader uh, improvement of uh, the um, mathematics field and so i've i've been like uh uh taking on some roles as uh, like uh, the um the todos uh mathematics for all uh, webmaster and and things like that to to try to uh, give back to the the uh the uh, community and to help improve the community and so uh i i think that it's easy for uh, like a, a group of us, like who are all here, who are, uh, of course, interested in in a, a diversity, equity, and inc inclusion, because we're here to to uh, feel like you know, like we're doing our part to at least uh, at the minimum educate ourselves and uh, like uh, do better for our students. But I think it 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 definitely goes beyond. Um, beyond that and so uh beyond like just our little silos that that we're in sometimes and so that's why i i think that uh the the title today even uh changing the game and mathematics classrooms really is um sort of uh inspiring in a a way that it, it makes me think of it as something more than beyond just what I, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, John. Um, Homa? Uh, hi, I'm Homa Gaussi. I'm a Michigander. Um, I teach at Lansing Community College right now. I've been teaching here for 17 years. Uh, before that, I was at Oakland University and Wayne State University. That's where I have my degrees too. And at Wayne State University, um, I was helping with the Emerging Scholar Program. And that was all about bringing minorities and making them feel good about themselves and turning them into honor students. Um, I'm here today to learn from you guys. And I usually teach the calc sequence, differential equation, linear algebra courses. Um, yeah, we don't have that many minority students here. <laughs> Thank you, Homa. Um, I think we're getting towards the end, and if, I, if I, you've already spoken, I apologize because folks are moving around the screen a little bit. Trina? I'm Trina Hagedis. I am an adjunct at Kellogg Community College. Uh, I teach whatever they will let me teach each semester. Uh, I was, the, the reason that I'm here is that one of the foundational aspects of my approach as an educator is fairness in all things, trying to t treat everyone as fairly as possible. So the idea of equity and inclusion is particularly close to my heart. Um, and, and I think uh, really we're all sort of trapped by this situation where we best understand our own experiences and background and without sort of pushing outward to seek out knowledge about other people's experiences and other people's backgrounds, we sort of get a little slowed down making progress there. So I'm here today try, to try to continue making progress on, on my journey to try to be understanding of all people and to, to understand experiences other than my own. Thank you, Trina. Um, Melinda? Okay, I'll try Chris. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Cockrell. I'm from uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College. Uh, we were looking at gateways to completion, and uh, that's when I really 
uh, for the first time saw the gap. And I'm not okay with that. So I'm here to learn from anybody that has information to help us close that gap and uh, teach everyone equitably. Yeah, so that uh, sounds like we all have a real common experience of seeing data that shows we're not serving all our students well with what we're currently doing. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so thanks everyone. I'm gonna get us started on our first activity. Uh, to kind of think about that reading, um, I'm going to put a link to it um, in the chat, a link to the reading in the chat so you have access to it in case you didn't get to time to do your pre-assignment. Um, chat. There we go. And what we're going to do is um, think about this quote. So as we're thinking about some of the systemic barriers to learning mathematics, um, we still also want to really maintain high academic standards. And what I'm going to ask you to do in groups is use one of these ideas that was in the reading, either the four dimensions of equity that Rochelle Gutierrez talks about, um, the equality versus equity conversation, the anti-deficit perspective that was discussed in the article, and then the growth mindset. And I'm going to ask Julie to put us into, I think four groups will be good. Um, I'm also going to put a link to the slides. Uh, let's see. I'll just do it this way. How do I want to do it? <sighs> Oh, I'll do it this way. There we go. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you just put the link to the slides, Claire? I can't. No, hear that you. was my fault. Um, I I didn't copy it correctly. I guess it's it's working. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So we all everyone has access to the slides now. Is that true? No. Okay. All right. All right. Then I will now. Let's see. I will put that link in, I thought. Share. And I put it in. Sorry, this is taking a long time. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, Claire, Claire put it in there for me. Thank you so much. And if you look ahead, um, I want you to record. Um, so you're gonna use one of these concepts to kind of talk about this quote, under, either understanding what some of the systemic barriers are, while also, um, thinking about maintaining high standards. And what you're going to do is on the next couple of slides, you'll see that there's a place for each group to just kind of type into the Google slide their big takeaway. And then we'll come back in um, a few minutes to um, share what we talked about. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna give you about eight to 10 minutes to work in your groups. Um, any questions about what you're doing? You're going to link. reassign what? I'm sorry. Oh, the link gives view access and not right access. So I just pasted it with the, the correct access. Thank you. Okay. All right. And um, are you ready to go? Julie, Cla yeah, yeah. Claire and I will join groups too. So okay. Well, it automatically assigned you, but I can rearrange you if you want to. Oh, no, that's fine. I, you're, you're not together. I split you up. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think everybody should be back, Anne. Oh, you're still muted, Anne. No wonder <laughs> nobody back, responded to me. <laughs> when you come back, it always mutes you. Good to know. Okay, so I'd like to ask so who from breakout group one wants to tell us a little bit about their discussion of the four dimensions of equity with respect to um, still maintaining high academic standards. I will. So our, our group talked a lot about um, building the classroom environment, the classroom atmosphere. So we talked about building a math family in the classroom during the first first day of the first week of class. Um, we want to have learning that takes place and participation is encouraged. Um, students establish the classroom environment. So um, we talked about having student asking students what they would like out of the class during the first during the semester, 
what, um, what are some of their expectations in the class, um, their likes and dislikes from previous experiences, um, have, letting the students have a say in uh, the learning environment, um, understanding that students have other responsibilities besides just the math class that they're enrolled with you in. They have other um, work and family responsibilities. Um, um, we talked about having students do a scavenger hunt to introduce themselves to the class and to the instructor. And then um, the, um, the instructor would take notes on the students' videos that they send back so that the, the, the instructor would learn more about the students. And then we spent some time talking about the challenges of teaching online this semester. Um, but we, um, in terms of group work, we, we talked about the challenges of having group work in, in virtual learning. Thank you. I just lost, I'm sorry, I just completely, I don't know why, my slideshow just completely disappeared. So let me open it up again. Now, I want to ask you um, a little bit about, did you think about any of those in terms of the four dimensions of equity? So let me, let me get my screen back up and going and get to that slide. Um, so I'm going to bring up working breakout group one here, present, share screen. Okay, should be back now. So students have a say in their learning environment. So where does that kind of fit on these dimensions of equity? So we have the access and achievement access and the identity and power access. I would think that's more under power, having the students have some say in their learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes. also the introduction, like introducing themselves to the class and to the instructor could be the identity portion. Yeah, 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 I like that. Other thoughts about the four dimensions of equity? So unfortunately, mm -hmm. several of us didn't realize we had a pre-reading assignment. Oh, okay, I so understand. we we weren't very well able to apply it because it was yeah. too much to read during yeah. the breakout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand absolutely. Okay, let's go to breakout room two. The equality versus equity conversation. Someone from Bluetooth like to share? All right, I feel I dominate conversations too much, so I gave the awkward pause to give other people a chance. But, um, well, I guess everyone was kind of talking about how they've been making their classroom more inclusive. But then, uh, as I read these over, we also talked about how that is, if not more challenging, different in a remote learning environment and how we could sort of recreate that it was also interesting to compare uh, hearing about how some of the high schools do things like remotely putting um, the putting a tutoring center in a trailer park that's got a large number of students and thinking about how maybe we could find a way at the community college to find where our students are at um, and I guess that summarizes it. Do any of you wish to add to it now that you've heard the, the horrible job I've done summarizing our discussion? There are other, I'm sure some of you have seen other versions of this, this graphic that is on page um, 124 on the equality versus equity. And I've seen another one, like when the barrier comes down, the, the next one is liberation. I don't know if people have seen that one, but it's really about thinking about taking down those barriers as well, um, this idea. And I think we were kind of trying to talk about that with like some of the things that we offer. Uh, and again, my high school perspective is probably way different, but trying to offer those kids extra transportation to stay for tutoring or pick them up and providing meals and food and such like that to um, right. 
have them stay because that is sometimes the barrier is the child care. They have to go watch their siblings or so many of those other things. So if we could provide child care on site with transportation and just really trying to eliminate all of those um, barriers into mm -hmm. education. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. And then one other thing we talked about is just like the, you know, in the equity versus equality, like having access to the material, especially again in COVID breakout or in remote world, but yeah, someone might have access to all the material and be doing work on their phone and that's it because that's how they have access. So they have the same access, it's equal, but in how that they can use it is not um, equitable across, you know, depends on if they're rural or if they're sharing bandwidth or any of these sorts of things that go on as well. I've had a lot of students this semester with connectivity issues, definitely. And one thing that I shared with them is that our university has a, a page on their IT section that indicates hotspots on campus. And then it has another one for hotspots at other universities in Michigan. And then the third one is hotspots all over the state of Michigan. And so I point that out to them, you know, in case they're not even on campus this semester, that their local library can often help with that. Because I've had a lot of students really struggle with that, their Wi-Fi access. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I have bad internet too, so <laughs> I can identify. Okay, breakout group three, anti-deficit perspectives. Well, I think I asked most questions, so I'll, I guess I'll speak up. Um, most of most of what uh, I was thinking were questions about the dichotomy between you know uh, identity and power, uh, and getting students to learn the way that I think that uh, most is most effective uh, for their retention versus what they're comfortable doing. And, uh, and so I struggle between the two. Um, and I'm just looking for some perspective on that. Um, something that was brought up a lot is um, how you create uh, the classroom culture to be a safe environment for people to feel like they have their own identity in there um, <clears throat> while still doing the work that you're structured to do. Um, and then uh, we talked a little about how we're doing this remotely, um, you know, having uh, small group discussions and breakout rooms and how to hold students responsible for actually creating those discussions or having rich discussions in breakout rooms. Um, but that was, that's my perspective of what we really talked about and came up with. I see some stuff on the slides. Um, around bias when calling on students and um, students feeling comfortable versus high academic standards. Someone want to speak to that in that group? Yeah, so that was uh, something else that we ta I talked about was, you know, being aware of who we're calling on um, and, uh, and intentionally calling on students um, to get a full representation of everyone in the class instead of just those extroverts that always speak up you know, and then uh, uh, part of my perspective is, is even when I do tend to, or I think in general, when people tend to purposefully uh, call on students, uh, there are those times that those uh, biases just pop up in there and you end up calling on the same students because you know you can get a quick or correct answer from certain students to keep the class moving. Thank you. Um, Group four. So just, um, Anne, is, yeah. if that's yours, that presenter view is in front of the slides there. <laughs> we can see that. Okay. Thank you. I, I put it on my other screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Sandy. Mm -hmm. So I got nominated to talk for breakout group four. Um, 
And we noted that uh, we often hear the benefits of growth mindset, but it's important to read what it says in the instructional practices guide that if we just focus on that, then we're ignoring all the systemic things going on. That uh, our growth mindset and grit aren't quite the same concept, but if we just tell our students, you don't have enough grit, we're ignoring how much grit they got, they had to get to our classroom in the first place and all the other things going on in their, in their lives. Um, so uh, we have to, you know, it's not bad to talk about growth mindset, but not treat it as the magic bullet. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we also kind of questioned the whole quote of maintaining high academic standards. Well, standards probably aren't a unidimensional thing. Um, and the more stress you put on this standard, the less thing, less time you have for this other important thing. Um, and uh, it wasn't quite on our page of reading, but we were talking about who set the current standards, what should the standards be, who benefits from the standards being the way they are. Um, so uh, all that kind of thinking. Thank you. Claire, do you have anything you want to add to this before we wrap up this, this task? She's good, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to introduce this idea of signature pedagogies. Um, it's from Lee Shulman's work. Um, I don't know if anybody's read anything by him. He's, he was at Stanford. He's an educational psychologist. He was also a past president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. I really like his work. Um, and we're not going to dig deep into signature pedagogies, but we're going to use it as a tool to kind of um, look at our teaching practice as a discipline, how we teach mathematics. So I want to kind of think about this quote. This is the very beginning of this paper. Um, Eric er Erickson once observed that if you wish to understand culture, study its nurseries. There's a similar principle for understanding professions. If you wish to understand why professions develop as they do, study their nurseries. In this case, their forms of professional preparation. When you do, you will generally detect characteristic forms of teaching and learning that I've come to call signature pedagogies. All right, so basically the claim is that there's, there are some explicit and implicit um, structures in just kind of the, the way we go about our business of teaching mathematics. Um, and this is the next quote is what I really want us to use today to um, think about this. Um, and I find this just very powerful. Signature pedagogies are important precisely because they're pervasive. Um, they implicitly define what counts as knowledge in the field and how things come to be known. They define how knowledge is analyzed, criticized, accepted, or discarded. They define the functions of expertise in the field, the locus of authority, and the privileges of rank and standing. These pedagogies even determine the architectural design of institution, educational institution, which in turn serves to perpetuate these approaches. So I'm gonna leave this here just for a moment. Um, and I want to give some people some time to kind of, kind of look at this and think about what might be some of the, the messages. And we're going we're gonna to look at some actual video from classrooms um, after the break. But what, what might be some of the messages students get about what counts as mathematics from our classrooms and how things come to be, mo um, be known? I'm going to turn this over to the whole group to kind of think about this. So here's an example that, that came up in another group I was talking to today. Like there's something that's really pervasive in mathematics. And that is we like to name mathematical objects and theorems after people. So, um, and sometimes those, the, the 
what we're, um, and that's kind of, it's pervasive, right? It's very pervasive. You have to sort of think about what those messages say about what counts as knowledge. It has a name on it, right? <laughs> and um, how things come to be known. Um, kind of related to that, I was thinking that um, I know some teachers have tried to highlight different um, historical mathematicians besides the traditional white dudes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's helpful because if they can see other mathematicians that look like them, that can definitely help a student. And also it's true that in some cases, you know, multiple people either worked on a concept or separately developed it, but usually it's the old white dude who gets his name on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. We had um, one of the, the mathematicians who worked with us last year on the Inclusive Excellence Project. Her, um, she was a full professor in math. She was teaching graduate courses. And she wanted to, to highlight the diversity of, of mathematicians in her course. But she was actually able, she, was, um, she did number theory. Um, and she was actually able to find in her own research group a diversity of mathematicians among the people she worked with. So it wasn't just people out of a book. These are actually her colleagues in the field. And so she brought these, the, the people to the class and what they did, what they contributed to, what they're contributing to number theory. And I just thought that was a really cool project to take on. Other things that might be part of our signature pedagogies of teaching mathematics. What does it tell our students? We divide. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we divide things into um, techniques. And so sometimes when even we acknowledge there are several different ways to do something on that day in class, there might only be one correct way to do it. So take finding the vertex of a parabola, right? The appropriate way to do it is to graph it and touch the point on Desmos but you could also do it by completing the square. Um, there's a formula you can use. And typically these would be like three, these could be up to three different sections in a book. And on Tuesday, what was right on Monday isn't right anymore. And on Wednesday, what we're doing on Tuesday might not be right, you know, until Thursday, then they're all okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I do acknowledge that you know, I let them know we're learning this particular technique. And in this section, I want you to do the problems using this technique, but this isn't the only way to do it. And once we're done learning the different techniques, you'll be able to use whichever one you're most comfortable with. So this idea of nurseries um, is interesting to me because I think, uh, you know, we're talking about, way that we teach and looking at nurseries that way, but also the way students learn coming from the nurseries of elementary school. Um, and they've been taught to be successful in a certain way because of, you know, our education system for uh, elementary school mathematics. Um, whereas a student might have a fantastic idea and express it in a different way than what the, uh, I used, to, I used to do work with a program to help develop elementary school teachers and create modules. And the unfortunate part about it is elementary school teachers mostly didn't go into teaching because they want to teach mathematics. So their limited understanding of the, the concept themselves limits what's considered correct from the student. And so successful students have learned how to uh, answer these questions in the way that the teacher wants where our unsuccessful students are confused why their correct answer or concept is incorrect. And therefore they stop trying and giving. Yeah, you know, you really made me think of something. It's another part of the instructional practice guide that um, 
wasn't part of the reading, um, but it made me think about signature pedagogies. Um, instruction should this is instruction should be designed for all, not just some students. It's a common belief that individuals are either smart and able to do mathematics or they are not. This can lead to an approach where teaching simply offers students an opportunity to see that they're in the smart category, right? That's really kind of playing the game, that dominant access that some of us read about in the reading. Um, okay, so I think what we'll do, what happened to our break? Oh, huh. Claire, is this, are we supposed to be taking a break now and then coming back to the activity? I think that that, I, I know we were going to do the activity first, but I think that that's probably a good idea. I think so too. Okay, so let's take five minutes so we can refresh our beverages. Um, I'll see you back in five minutes. I like Shanna's um, picture on her Zoom. Yeah, I think she just joined from a different meeting. Okay. <laughs> and Hi, our welcome. five minutes, according to my watch, is up. Just okay. Like, All just right. Just so you know. <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to turn things over to Claire. Just going to go back to the activity. Oops. I'm trying. There we go. I guess I should wait till Claire comes back before turning it over to her. <laughs> there she is. I'm here, just hiding. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, are are we ready to to keep going? Or hopefully, we're good to go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think I can. So what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of take this idea of um, signature pedagogy. So we're going to watch some examples of two different instructors working um, with some groups in a mathematics classroom. And as we're watching the videos, I, um, I want us to kind of to think about these three questions. Um, what counts as knowledge in mathematics? Who counts as an expert or authority in these mathematics classrooms? And then which classroom is an example of signature or pervasive pedagogies that um, that we think of um, when we think about math, uh, a mathematics classroom? Um, okay. So I think Anne, you either have to stop sharing so that I can share, or or um, I stop sharing. Okay. I also pasted in the chat these questions so you have access to them. Okay. Can we see the screen okay? And hopefully I'm sharing audio. Okay. There we go. Okay, um, this is everybody's graph? Yes. So if I asked any of you. Just to ask, can we all hear the sound okay? Yeah. If you did explain yes. the story to me, you'd be all right with it. Why don't you start telling me the story? Okay, so ours is, initially we had two lines, a straight one, and this one. And we said that as if a child is hoisting it up, then it depends on what speed he's doing it at, if it's constant or not constant. Okay. So is this graph, why don't you tell me, is this graph constant? Yeah. This is a con ah, sorry. No, I messed it up, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> technology. <laughs> It always feels like 10 years when it's you happening to you, but it really isn't. I, we promise. <laughs> okay. okay, we'll try that. Initially, we had two lines, a straight one and this one. This one. And we said that uh, if a child is hoisting it up, then it depends on what speed he's doing it at. If it's constant or not constant. Okay. So is this graph, why don't you tell me, is this graph constant? This is a con so this is a constant rate uh, of, of uh, hoisting up the flag? No. No. Yeah. no. We're saying that he got tired. Oh. Actually, like the child would tire out because if it's yeah. an infinitely tall uh, flag, the kid is going to have it. It's a really, it's a really, okay. Why don't I come back in a minute and I'll ask you to make sure you agree with that. I mean, it's okay to disagree and convince them something else. When you're done convincing each other, start on this, please. To the six power, but there's some sort of constant in the front that's kind of. Yeah, that would make sense. It'd have to be x to the six because then when you take the derivative, you lose a power. Right. So, All right. So then, that's like so the only thing you would know about this is it's raised by the six power. So if your original, so if your original function was x to the six, what's the derivative? So well, I guess six x to the six. So what can you multiply yeah, six? So it's so it's not quite six. So how do you get rid of that x that six in front? Well, so x to the 6 was close. You want to still be thinking about those lines, but somehow you want to alter it a little. So how would you make... Mm -hmm. So would you um, use a rule? No, no, but if you do, so, like, how would you get rid of this six? This is the backwards. Thing. What would make it cancel out? This is what we're so, so, like, so, so what would happen if we divided the original one by six? I'm trying to see if I put it back if I can get that. Now what would the derivative be? So this is what you have You would use one of the... So one thing. Okay. Oh, so we're not taking so do that. back. So yeah. 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 do that. Yeah. Sure, you can do that. Oh, okay. So then... That's a little more complicated than you need to do it. So remember, like, the 6 in the bottom, that's just a constant. Do you know how to take the derivative of x to the 6 divided by 6? <laughs> so you have the tools. It's totally, I would just resort to counter tool, but that's a lot of work. But so go ahead and use it. It's a lot of work, but you can use it. So check. Okay, so those were the, the two, two videos. So I wanna give us uh, just a couple minutes to kind of quietly think about um, the, the, the three questions, just to give everybody a little bit of time to think it over. So we'll take two minutes to just think. Okay, so does anybody want to share any ideas they had? Any kind of sort of thoughts about these questions and those videos? Um, well, the first video, I think the instructor was sort of trying to put the authority more on the students, like that they, they have to convince each other while clearly the instructor was acting as the expert in the second one. Amy agreed. I think it was interesting uh, what counted as knowledge in both classrooms. I'm sorry. Um, Whereas the first classroom, uh, 
knowledge was considered understanding uh, in depth of what's actually happening in a situation. Whereas the second classroom, uh, knowledge was considered procedure, uh, what steps to take, um, how to take those steps. Even as, she's saying, even as the student came up with their own idea, she kept indicating, well, you can do it, but it's a little, that, it might be a little difficult to do it that way. Um, so the, definitely what counted as knowledge is different. Um, but I also, it, it's also interesting to see uh, what, maybe what the purpose of each classroom was, because it, without some type of procedural knowledge, um, can we really understand what we're doing? Or if we don't understand what we're doing, how are we expect to come up with the correct procedure? You know, so they're, they're really uh, expecting two different things in two different levels from students as well. Yeah, sorry if we forgot to introduce the problems they were working on. The first problem they're doing, are, are they're graphing um, height versus time for the height of a flag as it's being raised. And in the second one, they're finding the antiderivative of x to the sixth. I think it's important to know, like, with the two different activities, one lends itself more to being that open-ended, the students can be the authority, let's check in, how are you doing process, and some others do not lend themselves as well. So you have those, like, high-rich tasks, and then you some have some tasks that are, like you said, very procedural, and it's like that balance between and when you're giving that authority within the classroom um, can be difficult to you know, walk. And I know as we do curriculum development through K through 12, it's a really hard struggle, especially I heard earlier talking about the elementary teachers, um, having some of those procedural type stuff that we would consider like drill type problems, drill and skill. Um, but they're very much so now pushing away from that in the elementaries and having them everything be very open-ended in these thought processes. And as they're coming to us, you know, in high school and not knowing their factors and not knowing the basic procedural stuff, we've noticed a struggle to even do those open-ended problems to allow them to be the authority. So it's, it's interesting to think about when to apply the one method versus the other, depending on the content you're trying to get across. Yeah, I think that uh, something somebody said in the chat is, it is very connected to this, is the speed in which we expect students to process. That, that's a pers that, I would consider that a pervasive thing throughout mathematics. Um, the way that we traditionally taught math uh, was, you know, lecture, 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 lecture. And we're trying to change the way that we teach math for a deeper understanding of mathematics. But I don't think that that timeline has changed. You know, we still expect the same amount of content uh, in that same amount of time period. And conceptual growth and understanding takes longer than procedural or lecture. So we can cover much more knowledge in lecture. The depth of knowledge is going to be smaller. So I think that's something that, that maybe we can, should consider as well. I know like calculus classes are moving from uh, three credit hours to four credit hours to some five credit hours because of that, that issue. We have the same amount of content, but we're delivering a different way for a deeper understanding because we want people to understand it better. I know that in our gateways to completion program, you know, we recognized the fact that we were adding in certain things like active learning and mindset and so on. And you're right, there's only so much time per class. And so we were concerned that we wouldn't be able to cover as much material. Our hope, and I don't know how it worked out, but our hope was that by helping them better learn how to learn, even if we covered a few less topics, they'd be more self-starters in learning things in the future. So again, I don't know how well that worked out, but that was at least the thought. Which brings another philosophical question is, are we, are we teaching them to learn and think? Or are we teaching them to get to a certain point so that they can achieve something? So I guess I'm just going to throw out one more question to kind of get us back towards the students. So if you were a student in each of these classrooms, um, how would you feel? 
Like how was, how did, you know, how are students experiencing these two different pedagogies? From my own experience as an instructor, when you put it back on the students to say, hey, figure it out and teach each other or, you know, like convince each other or not. Um, I've had students when I've done that, look at each other like, she's not gonna tell us and they're pissed, right? Like she's not gonna tell us what's right or wrong. And it's, so I don't know that it's great for the students because they walk away thinking, I still don't know and she's not helping. Um, but they don't see necessarily the growth that's happening with those sort of questions, if that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it does. I think, what, I think I forget who mentioned this already, um, but what I find really interesting about the second video is they've disrupted the norm of the teacher standing in front of the room and working through examples, but the teacher still holds all that authority. Uh, and I think that's really a pervasive that's part, part of the pervasive part of our practice, right? That students come, if students are still coming, thinking that we're the authority and we have the answers, then obviously that's something very pervasive in the pedagogy. Um, Claire, I think we, do you want to move on? Because I do want to um, get those, those practical examples or do you want to wrap something up here? Oh, I was just, I, could, I was just going to comment, like, in the, I don't know if you notice in the, fir, the second video, the first time you watch it through, you, maybe you don't, don't notice, but the teacher standing over, she's asking the same, essentially the same question of the student trying to get him to understand over and over again. And if you watch the two girls that are also in the group that are stand, that, that she's standing right next to, like, they're, they're, one of the girls is like, oh, oh, like, they're having an aha moment over there, and she's totally ignoring it asking the same, the, you know, being the authority, asking the same question over and over again. And that just struck me as, wow, that really says, you know, sh she's not, I don't know, maybe she just didn't notice, but she's, she's taking all the authority and, and we're going to do it this one way, rather than leaning into what's happening next to her and, and trying to, you know, um, look at those different perspectives that maybe those other students could help that student understand. So that was really striking to me. And that really said to me a lot about that the authority and that signature pedagogy of, you know, the, the teacher in front of the room and um, I know everything and, right. So. Yeah, it was very striking to me too, because at first I thought the whole table was a group, but then it looked like the teacher was only concentrating on the one student and then a little bit on the one, you know, next to him. And then it just seemed like those two girls or whoever they were on the left were not even part of the group. All right, so does anybody have any other last minute things to add or? I had a, a quick follow up to what Barbie said. Um, I actually have an open ended question as an assignment going on right now, one of my courses. Um, and I found that if I just tell them why I'm not answering them, that they stop being so mad. Cause yes, they do get mad <laughs> if you don't show the authority figure. Like they, they, they want you to be the math authority. But if I just make a simple statement as I'm doing this, cause I want you to be able to think critically um, and think outside of the box. And there's many different ways to arrive and reason your way through this. This is why I'm doing this. Then they'll leave, will not leave me alone, but stop being um, mad at me. So <laughs> it, it's a really, <laughs> was a really Really simple fix that I kind of stumbled upon um, but I actually do share with my students some of the pedagogy I always say who's gonna be a teacher guess what we're about to try today it kind of works out though <laughs> that's great thank you for sharing that I share that with the four C's of like employability when we're thinking about those four C's of like creative being creative, critical thinking, communication, that's all that ability of, you know, being able to find and solve your own problems. And I think like our whole, you know, point is to learn how to communicate and critically think um, and be creative in that problem solving process so that we can eventually get those jobs. So I just always try to reinforce like that employability aspect behind that uh, pedagogy process. Great. Well, Thank you, everyone. Um, so I think I'm going to turn over to Ann now to talk about uh, some, move on to talk about some actual practices. 
Thank you. And now you can all see yourself. There you go. I'm going to move you back to the screen. Um, so this is a framework, and I put a link to the framework um, in the chat. I also put a link to a paper that's that's discussed here. And this was this is a framework developed by one of my colleagues at Oregon State that we've been using to talk about equitable and inclusive teaching practices here. Um, and um, it looks at this, this idea of social justice pedagogy as the intersection of inclusive practices and critical practices. There's a lot here. We're going to focus on the inclusive side of this today. Um, yes, this week I did a workshop on just literacy, a two-hour workshop on just the literacy component. That other side, there's a lot to unpack. Um, but the, the PDF that um, I put a, towards the framework has a lot of nice examples, so you'll have time to unpack this on your own too. But there's three, three parts of the inclusive pedagogy. There's this idea of access, and the example he has there um, it says curating and open access learning materials for first year chemistry to mitigate the cost of textbooks. So providing access by using open resources. And the next component is belonging. And the example that's there on the figure is revising curricula to em emphasize the contributions of women and people of color. I think somebody brought that up earlier today. And finally, success and the example here, there's more examples on this, the, the framework that I shared, um, employing um, Tanner's strategies for classroom participation. So um, Kim Tanner wrote a paper on sort of 21 inclusive practices. I also put that a link to that in the chat too, just as a resource for you. Um, so what I want us to do is, um, I'm going to put people into three groups, and um, Julie, this time I'll just stay out of the group because I talk too much. I don't know. Claire, you can decide whether you want to go to a group or not. Um, and what we're going to do is eat, one group's going to really dig into the examples on this, this framework. Um, so on the framework, there are three goals and then examples that illustrate each of the goals. So what I want you to do in your group, if you're assigned to access, is really unpack it. And then I want you to think of some things you could do in, in our classrooms, our math classrooms, um, to improve access. And as many things as we can come up to, it'd be really nice to have one thing for each goal. And then another group's going to look at belonging, and another group's going to look at success. So um, does everybody kind of understand the task? Does everyone have access to this framework, the social justice education framework? So I think everybody should be back. Awesome. Well, welcome back. Um, so I think we'll just go through and have everybody maybe share some of their ideas that they got working together. Um, so breakout room one. We we're talking about access or working on access. I can talk. Um, so we picked for the goal was mitigating barriers. And honestly, we did not get as far as we would have liked. We had a lot of really good discussions. Um, <clears throat> you know, open source textbooks we talked about. Um, and, you know, we were thinking about financial and technological barriers. Um, also, many of our schools have now integrated the textbook and homework system, like My Lab Math with Pearson. And like at our school, <clears throat> we've done it so that the cost is baked into their tuition fees, which is, I That's think, crazy. allows them to let their financial aid pay for it. And so it means we never have to worry about student A saying, I can't afford it till payday or whatever. Um, although we did discuss the fact that I'm not really sure how much they read the actual textbook now that they have all these other online resources that are more targeted, you know, like help me solve this problem or the study plan, you know. Um, the last thing that we got to was consider what technology is really needed and not just what we traditionally think. Like in my department, we've al almost always told them that they need a graphing calculator for all the math classes. 
but in my developmental math class, honestly, we never use the graphing features. So I tell them they could get one if they know they're going to need it for a future class and they can afford it. But if they can't, they can get a $10 or $11 scientific calculator. Or in many cases, you know, they can use an online calculator in our testing environment, we, I haven't played with it, but we also have the ability to have the calculator that's built into it. Or there's also like emulators that will emulate a graphing calculator on your phone as well. That's it. Awesome, thank you, Sandy. Um, I don't see access, let's see. Are we skipping to success? <laughs> oh no! Somebody yeah. talked about access. I'm sure. Okay. Break out room two. Okay. So well, who was in? Uh, oh, go ahead. We <laughs> uh, didn't know how to access this slide here, and we discussed belonging. I think we discussed the entire wrong topic. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> or I can discuss what we discussed if you'd like, but it's definitely not access. We didn't. That's fine. No, it was all about belonging. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so talk about belonging. That's fine. You can talk about belonging. All right. uh, Shia, do you want to talk about that? I think you had the best uh, perspective on, on a lot of that. So what we discussed was, uh, you know, what type of activity could encourage belonging. And uh, I talked about... Um, the um a collaborative like project and i gave the example of a wiki project that i use sometimes but i give like defined roles or defined tasks like these things have to be accomplished but you guys as a group get to decide who and how uh but everybody basically has a defined role and each role is equally important um and so one of the things um that i do require with that is is that they um, communicate in the chat area. I use um, Teams for this, um, so I can, the chat is saved and recorded. Um, and so in the chat area, uh, if I notice and I do observe it and watch it, that somebody is, you know, kind of hanging back or could use a little more encouragement or whatever, I can actually reach out to them individually. Um, I can send a private chat if it's happening live during class, or I can reach out to them via email, you know, and, and help them learn how to communicate and, and feel like they belong and contribute. Um, but the end product, and I do discuss this with the students, is, is that every part, and, uh, you know, that has to be accomplished is equally important so that they could all feel like they're making an equal um, contribution um, and feel like they're belonging in the sense of creating to the, the greater good of whatever task it was or the work. Um, so yeah, does anybody else want to elaborate from the group? I think one of the most important part of that uh, defining roles is, like she said, they get to choose their role. So they're choosing a role that they're most comfortable with and feel like they can contribute with the best instead of, uh, you know, letting them decide everything on their own. Some people are going to take over. Some people are going to sit back, um, you know, so they get to they have some choice in there and get to use their personality based on what roles are available. So they have to participate, but they get to do it within their comfort level as well. Overachievers. <laughs> Shanna, can you give us an example of a project like this you've given? Uh, I've done it for um, final exam review. Uh, every group has a chapter to cover. And so the wiki page that they build, um, it will be a giant wiki page of basically the whole course by the time the entire class does everything. But within each chapter, I want certain things covered. So a formula list, vocabulary list, a few examples, some um, uh, samples, examples uh formulas i'm trying to think what else like however i parse it out like every group has the same amount of parts and it's enough so it's one part per person but the the critical part in this is is that if somebody slacks off then that's everybody's final exam review so they seem to take more ownership in that 
Um, and I based the final off of some of the things that I see posted. I do write it myself though, but yeah, so like they, they seem to be more invested in it and everybody wants to do their part with that type of thing going on because it is a useful tool for them. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, do you, do you have, um, have them recreate that every semester or once they've got it for one course, that's it? Oh, no, no, no. We have to keep doing it, right? Everyone okay. can do it a little bit different. <laughs> All right. No, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I just tried it last semester in the summer semester. Um, it was the first time that I've done it that way online because of the situation. In class, it's been more of the giant, you know, the board size sticky note and every group gets the giant sticky note and then the sticky note goes on the board um, and that's a uh, class period. I used to do Jeopardy, but there was one incident where Jeopardy went horribly wrong. So I don't do Jeopardy anymore. And that's, that's what replaced Jeopardy. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Breakout room three. Well, I guess we talked both at a big level and the classroom level. Like, I mean, if you talk about negotiating success, basically that's what the pathways movement is, right? You, not everyone has to do some subset of algebra and calculus anymore, do something appropriate. Um, a lot, we didn't really come up with, I felt like a ton of new ideas. We were sort of maybe classifying things we were already doing. And so maybe each of us got one new idea out of this. Uh, and a lot of, oh yeah, out of it. So I guess that's, I got y'all started. What do you all want to add now? We just talked, we talked a little bit about just making sure that all students have access to, especially since we're teaching online, having, having access to everything that we usually have in the classroom, um, handouts, making sure like, if we can have videos on what we typically would lecture during the, during a normal class, so it's that all students would be able to have that um, closed caption videos, of course. Thank you. Right. Well, I see it's it's noon our time. <laughs> I, you guys are on East Coast time, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, Claire's going to share a Jamboard in the chat. Um, for you guys to record what you learned and what you're going to do. And I know it's, our time is up, but if you could, you know, take some time to come back and um, tell us this, that would be really helpful for us. Um, there are two boards on it. So there's a what you, uh, what did you learn and what are you going to do on each? So I'm just going to say thank you, and it was wonderful to learn with you all today. Um, here's our contact information. If you want any of these resources after the chat is gone, please don't feel free to reach out. Thank you, Anne and Claire. Um, this was an extremely informative workshop, and I, I felt like I picked up several examples I can actually use in my own classroom starting Monday, really. Um, yeah, great. Um, I was going to, I'm going to say that this since this is um, – this webinar is being recorded. I'll make sure it's posted and shared with everyone that attended. And all the resources that you put into the chat also will make sure that everyone gets those as well.